Carol Jenkins, Executive Director at Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated. I'm working with Camille Wasowicz right here, and she is um, a nurse over at Stanford. We brought together this discovery series, and uh, we're glad to be here at the Crown Court Cabana Hotel. We have a special thanks for our sponsors, AMED Healthcare and Genentech, for making it possible for this series to happen. We note that everybody is signed in and we have hygiene kits in the back. We're glad to have our volunteers who are happy to help serve you any food because as always we have safety first. Um, thank you to Scott, our videographer, Scott Wakefield, who's working with us. And with that I'm going to turn the microphone over to Camille to introduce our speaker. Camille? Good evening and welcome. Thanks so much for coming. The program was developed by myself and Carol to address the quality of life issues for our CF patients and their families. In addition to that, being at Stanford, we had the accessibility to some really wonderful uh, specialized physicians and nurse practitioners, one of which with CF is sinus disease. And so we we're very fortunate to have Dr. Peter Huang and Jane Wang here to present on cystic fibrosis related sinus disease tonight. Ms. Wang is a graduate from UCLA. She's been a nurse practitioner for nine years, three years initially at UCLA, and then she transferred here to Stanford approximately five years ago. She has presented at the CF Teaching Day in 2009, as well as a retreat that CFRI offered in 2008. Dr. Peter Huang is the director of Stanford Sinus Center. He did his fellowship at the University of Penn in 96 and did his med school and residency at UCSF. He has been here for the past five years. Prior to that, he was the director of the Sinus Center at the Oregon Health and Science Center in Oregon. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Ms. Jane Wing. Thank you very much for the warm introduction. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Wang. Uh, I work at the Sinus Center as a full-time nurse practitioner uh, with a couple of our physicians, including Dr. Peter Wang. And also, we have a new physician just joined us about a year ago, uh, Dr. J. Karnayak. I have our business card, in which I will um, put at the end table at the end of the discussion. So today, our topic is cystic fibrosis and the sinusitis. So one thinks of uh, respiratory disease in cystic fibrosis is usually lung disease that comes to mind. However, uh, acute and chronic sinusitis are common among CF patients, uh, which can cause significant symptoms, and in some cases may contribute to the worsening of the lung disease. Anatomically, the lungs can be thought of as the lower respiratory tract, where the sinuses in the nose could be considered as the upper respiratory tract. Uh, by evaluating the respiratory tract as one continuous structure, uh, that's what we call a unified airway. Uh, it becomes easier to understand the underlying uh, pathophysiology and the treatment of uh, sinusitis among CF patients. Uh, so in terms of the uh, uh, sinus anatomy, so we humans, we have four paired air filled cavity it's located in between our eyes and below our brain. Uh, the sinuses are lined with what's called the cilia, the epithelium, similar in most ways to the layer of epithelium that lines the lower respiratory tract, our lungs and the uh, uh, bronchi. And our sinuses have rather small sinus drainage openings, it's called ostium, which is about two to four millimeters in diameter. So each of us produce about one quart of uh, drainage, the mucus, every day, uh, which drains through the small openings of the sinuses and down to the back of our throat, and then we just swallow it subconsciously. So here's a, a diagram. It's the, um, the coronal section, which is cut from the front to the back of our head. Uh, so it just show you quickly where the sinuses are. So here there are two frontal sinus right here. It's rather small, that's behind our forehead. And in between our eyes, those little 
uh, cells, almost like honeycombs, they're called ethmoid air cells. Uh, there are two big cavities behind our cheekbones, those are the maxillary sinus. And there's one more pair of sinus that's missing on that slide, which is the uh, sphenoid sinus, which is right here. It's almost in the middle of our skull already. Um, the reason we couldn't see it on the previous slide is because it's actually behind our ethmoid air cells and behind our eyes. Uh, and actually behind this sphenoid sinus is already the pituitary gland. So we're really inside of our skull pretty deep already. So the functions of the sinuses. Um, we're not quite clear, uh, actually, but we think the sinuses are there to help us to warm and humidify the air as we breathe, uh, to trap and filter particles from the air, either it's bacteria, spores, or dust, to lighten our skull and to provide resonant chamber for our voice. So what's the definition of sinusitis? So according to Dr. David Kennedy and Dr. Lanza, uh, sinusitis is an inflammation and infection of the mucous membranes and the underlying bones of the nasal passages and the sinus cavity. Uh, so there are three different types of sinusitis based on their time course. Uh, if the sinusitis lasts, the symptoms last up to four weeks and with total resolution of symptoms after you know, being treated, uh, it's considered acute sinusitis. Uh, if the symptoms last longer than four weeks but less than 12 weeks, it's considered subacute. And chronic sinusitis, the patient would have symptoms of 12 weeks or more. So it's rather long. So it's more than three months. So it's important to understand that healthy sinuses require normal mucociliary clearance. So this is a picture of a normal sinus. Um, mucosa. The mucosa is, a, is just the lining of our sinuses. So the mucosa, this picture is taken uh, under electron microscope with high magnification. It is the constant rhythmic movement of the cilia that keeps our sinuses clean and you know propel the mucus out of the uh, opening into the nasal cavity. So the, uh, it's very important to, to know that the anatomy of the sinuses does not really promote passive or gravitational drainage. Therefore, the cilia of the sinuses it has to work properly. Uh, otherwise, the uh, mucus will become stagnant inside of the sinus cavity and causing problems down the road. Uh, this slide shows the natural opening of the um, within the maxillary sinus. Uh, the cilia of the maxillary sinus uh, propel the, the mucus towards the natural opening, which is right here, of the sinuses. So just try to imagine, uh, imagine a three-dimensional cavity here. So this is the top of the cavity. This is the bottom of the cavity. Uh, this is close to the, the midline of her nose, and this is sort of to the lateral side of our face. So you would think that the, uh, the mucus will drain you know, by gravity and somewhere down here, but actually it's kind of go against the gravity and come out through the natural opening, which is at the uh, superior and anterior portion of the cavity. So uh, we've seen a lot of patients coming to us had previous sinus surgeries, and they have a surgical openings, or rather a pretty big surgical openings somewhere else other than the natural opening, but they still have problems you know, within that sinuses. That's because the, the uh, mucus still wants to drain you know, through the natural opening. So we have to make sure to, to do the right surgery to enlarge the natural opening instead of you know, making or creating a, a surgical opening, which doesn't really work in the long term. So just keep in mind uh, of this concept and also this slide, we'll come back to it uh, later during the presentation. So why sinus disease uh, in CF patient? So as we know, uh, CF patients produce uh, abnormally thick uh, mucus. And as, as we discussed before, the sinuses are lined with a layer of epithelium, which is 
what we call the cilia, similar in most ways to the layer of the epithelium that lines the lower respiratory tract. It's the res respiratory epithelium that's affected by cystic fibrosis. And the CF patient produce abnormally thick mucus, which is difficult to expel out of the sinus cavity, despite of a normal <laughs> ciliary function. So the cycle kind of starts from the abnormally thick mucus, and there's an impaired mucociliary clearance, and the mucus becomes stagnant. It just stay in the sinus cavity. Then the bacteria will become colonized in the sinuses, and then it causes the chronic inflammation within the sinuses, which induce the swelling of the mucosa, the lining of the sinuses, and cause the obstruction of the ostium, the small opening. Remember, the opening is only two to four millimeters in diameter. And then it makes the, the clearance of the mucus even harder. So it's sort of this vicious cycle, begin with this abnormally thick mucus. The, the cilia of the CF patient is functioning, in most cases, properly. It's just the thickness of the mucus is the, the base of the problem. So how do we diagnose sinusitis? Other couple of ways, you know, we listen to patients' history, you know, their symptoms. We do nasal endoscopy in our office. Uh, we look at the CT scans, and uh, we do sinus cultures sometimes. Uh, in terms of the symptoms, uh, patients need to meet certain criteria for us to diagnose sinusitis. So there are some major criteria facial pain and pressure, nasal congestion, uh, purulent rhinorrhea, that's just pussy nasal discharge, anosmia or hyposmia, that's uh, uh, lack of sense of smell or uh, no sense of smell. And there are some minor criteria listed here, headache, bad breath, fatigue, cough, and dental pain. So in order to diagnose sinusitis, the patient either has to have uh, two major criteria or one major criteria plus two minor criteria. Um, this is how um, probably your uh, general practic practitioner examine your nose. So this is, this device he's using is called an anterior rhinoscopy, uh, which has rather limited view of just the anterior portion of the nose. So in an ENT practice, in our clinic, uh, we use the rigid nasal endoscope, or sometimes we use the flexible um, uh, scope. So here's a, just a picture I took yesterday of uh, uh, me uh, scoping, using a rigid nasal endoscope, uh, scoping my medical assistant. Uh, <laughs> She looks rather pleasant here. Uh, so what she's wearing is a, a video goggle, so which allows her to see uh, what I see on this monitor screen. So when I'm doing the scoping, I'm not really looking at her nose. I'm actually looking at the screen. Uh, this is a, a relatively new um, gadget we, we had for about uh, six or seven months already. It allows me to uh, take snapshots pictures or videotape my examination. So it, it's, uh, it's a stored in the system and then, you know, <laughs> six months or a year down the road, the patient comes back, we can pull out the file and compare. So which is a very uh, good way of uh, tracking, uh, you know, the nasal endoscopy findings. And uh, this uh, video goggle, our patients, they love it. It's a great educational tool. Uh, sometimes it, it malfunctions, we just videotape it and then turn the patient around and we'll show them the video. So, okay. So I just want to quickly show you a uh, video. Uh, this is uh, a normal endoscopy, what a normal looking nose should look like. Okay, so the scope goes inside of the right side of the nasal cavity. Uh, here is the nasal septum. This is the inferior turbinate. So now the scope is hugging the floor of the nose going all the way to the back. So we want to be able to see all the way to the back. This is the nasal pharynx area. This is some residual adenoid tissues. This is a eustachian tube uh, opening. And then we'll tilt the scope a little bit up and that allows us to see it here. This is called a sphenoesmoid recess area where our uh, sphenoid sinuses and also the posterior portion of the esmoid sinuses would drain into. 
Uh, this structure is called a middle turbinate, which is a normal structure inside of our nose. And the space here, this is where the frontal sinus, the anterior portion of the esmoid air cells, and also our maxillary, sin uh, maxillary sinus drain into. So, you know, we're just looking to see if there's any pus, any polyps, uh, any anatomical uh, abnormalities. So that's a pretty normal looking nose. Uh, so here are just some common abnormal findings upon nasal endoscopy. Uh, this is a septal deviation. The septum is the structure in, in the middle of our nose to divide the nasal cavity. Actually, in this patient's case, even without the nasal endoscope, you could probably tell here is the, the cartilage portion is protruding inside of the uh, left nostril. So this patient most likely will complain of left-sided nasal obstruction. Uh, we also see uh, nasal polyps uh, quite often. Uh, the polyps uh, result from chronic inflammation in the lining of the nose and the sinuses, but just what triggers the inflammation, we, we don't really know. Uh, they are common in patients with cystic fibrosis, hay fevers, uh, asthma. And this is a picture of a patient with acute uh, sinusitis, you know, a cold turning into, you know, lasts for two, three weeks and never get better. You look inside of this nose, you can see the lining of the nose looks kind of angry, it's kind of red and swollen, and we can see obvious pus. So diagnostic study for, si uh, for sinuses, is it X-rays, plain films, or CT scan. So CT scan is the standard. It's a gold standard for study uh, sinuses. Yes? What is the radiation dosing? What would be the frequency allowed for CTs and repeats? Is there a uh, that's a good. That's a good question. Uh, we get a lot of, um, um, we get concerns about uh, repeat uh, sinus CT scans. Uh, we, we don't, as a brand new patient to the sinus center, we do require a recent CT scan, preferably within the last six months. Uh, simply because a lot of those patients, they've had chronic sinusitis, they've had probably multiple previous surgeries already. So their anatomy is very much altered. Uh, so in order for us to, ev to better evaluate their condition, we do require a CT scan. Um, and the decision to repeat the CT scan, it really is multifactorial. Um, sometimes it's based on their symptoms. If, the, if there are symptoms we could not, this, for example, if they complain of my left cheek is painful, there's pressure, and we repeatedly we look inside of the nose with a nasal endoscopy, and there's no evidence of sinus disease, uh, and then, you know, we might consider um, doing a CT scan just to see what's beyond the bones and the soft tissue that, you know, we cannot see. Um, so that's one of the main reasons we would repeat the CT scan. So we, so we, we kind of uh, make that decision very carefully because of the, uh, the concern of radiation exposure. Uh, the, one of the advantage we have here at Stanford is uh, we have a NIH grant and that allow us to have a, what we call a mini CAT, which is an in-office CT scanner. Uh, it, uh, it gives out probably 10 to 20 percent of the radiation dosing compared to the regular uh, CT scan you get from Stanford Radiology Department. Uh, it's equally accurate. The only uh, the only disadvantage of that is it's not going to be read by a radiologist, but it will be read by us. I mean, we read CT scans day in and day out, so we're pretty confident in terms of what we see there. Um, and also, it's compatible with the, uh, uh, the OR systems, so it could be used uh, during surgery as uh, computer navigation, which we will talk about a little later. Yeah. So CT scan is a study of choice for chronic sinusitis, not plain films. <laughs> um, so I just want to quickly show you what a normal uh, sinuses look like on a CT scan. So on a CT scan, the bones, like the skull, uh, they look white. And uh, soft tissue, like our eyeball, uh, the brain, and the cartilage, you know, in our uh, septum, the turbinates, those are the structures, normal structures I showed you, it should be gray. And the sinuses really should be filled with air, which is black. So the more black you see, 
the better. Uh, so this is a very normal looking maxillary sinus and uh, ethmoid air cells and a little bit of a uh, frontal sinus right here. And uh, this is the posterior portion of the ethmoid uh, air cells. So after looking at the normal CT images, and you could probably tell immediately this is not normal. So you can see this maxillary cavity is clear, it's filled with air, it's black, but this is completely filled with gray. So this could be pus, it could be a huge cyst, it could be polyps or some inverted papilloma, any kind of a mass. So this definitely needs to be uh, investigated, especially this is just on one side. Um, in this case, you can see that the ethmoid air cells in between the eyes is partially or almost completely, we call it opacified, so it looks gray. And then if you look at the maxillary cavity, it just doesn't look crisp. The lining, it just looks swollen. It's lined with gray, uh, which, which is inflammation, basically. Um, here is the CT scan of a CF patient. This is the same uh, patient. Uh, so what you see is a lot of gray. So basically, it's, uh, so this is the uh, sphenoid sinus. The left sphenoid sinus is uh, partially opacified, but the rest of the sinus is almost complete, completely opacified. So this patient, uh, you know, the sinuses are filled with uh, polyps and inflamed tissues. And this is another CF patient. Uh, again, uh, most of the sinuses are filled uh, with